So hello everybody, I'm actually doing um, a webinar myself for the first time. Um, I'm not delegating it to everyone else. Hang on a minute, I'm just going to move my computer screen back. Um, I much prefer it when I get other people to do the webinar, but um, I thought today I would um, come on and try and do a regular webinar every Sunday evening where we can talk about the themes that have come up during the week in the community. Um, I thought I'd just start with a, a small thing, which is what am I drinking this evening? So this here is um, chilled lemongrass and ginger tea. I have um, brewed it cold, so it's cold water with two lemongrass and ginger tea bags in, which you can see here, and put into the fridge for a short while. And it's sugar-free, caffeine-free, um, but lovely and refreshing. Um, so that's one of my top tips for a drink in the summer, which is a chilled herbal tea. You can also do it with loose leaf tea as well, which I could bore you with um, forever, but I thought that would be one to share with you today. So um, I hope you've got a drink and I'm going to start on looking at some of the subjects that came up this week. Okay, oh, I could probably do three bags in there actually. Okay, so what came up this week? Um, I was really interested that somebody else has brought up again that um, they've been having dreams of being drunk. Um, nine weeks in now and I'm having the maddest dreams, really vivid but mostly full of nonsense, anyone else experiencing the same. Um, my dream, I always dreamt um, quite vividly and I always remembered my dreams even when I was drinking. Um, but since giving up drinking, my dreams have been mad and vivid and um, utterly surreal at times. Um, and I try not to dig into too much of that. I actually um, enjoy them to some degree and I sometimes really wish I could remember them because there's some really great stories that happen and some of them wake up and go I do not understand what was going on but I suspect my um, sleep is so much better that I'm getting a lot more rapid eye movement time and therefore I'm getting more time to dream and actually take a dream to some conclusion rather than it being a jumbled mess or waking up with a, a stale mouth or, or through wanting water. The other thing that happens quite a lot, which some of you may have, is a relapse dream where you dream you get, you're getting drunk and I have those all the time still and it's four years since I've drunk. They are actually a really normal part of quitting alcohol and I actually think they're quite positive. I think they are part of your brain retuning itself. Um, and I think it's definitely worth writing down how you feel when you wake up from a dream where you think you're drinking. I wake up with a great sense of relief and that tells me a great thing about what my subconscious really wants for my life. It's saying to me, actually, Laura, um, you don't want to do this. The fact that you're frightened and the fact that you wake up with relief um, from that drunk dream is a really good thing. It's not a surprise that you might dream those things. After all, um, you're concentrating a lot on moderating or not drinking, and therefore you're thinking about drinking a lot. Um, it may feel that even if you've gone one, two, three, six months, one year down the line, you're still in the process of changing your relationship with alcohol. You'll probably still think about it quite a lot. So it's no surprise that your subconscious then asks you to dream about it and it influences your dreams. Um, it may be that something in the day triggers a memory about your um, your uh, your triggers for drinking. So you may have had something stressful happen. It's not unusual for you to have a dream about drinking if you've had a stressful day and that was a way that you used to relieve um, the tension of a stressful day. Um, your brain might remember that or it might be something else happened to the day that used to be a drink trigger. So again, it's your subconscious telling you things. It's not saying that you must drink and it's not saying that you're going to drink. It's saying that actually your brain's going through a retuning. And I think that's fantastic. And I think that's really exciting. And it's exciting to wake up with relief. And sometimes it takes a while. I wake up like, oh, oh, I'm sure. What did I dream? I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Am I drunk? And I have to double check myself. 
I think there are some also some positive benefits of having a drinking dream. Um, if you wake up and you're shit scared about the fact that you had um, a dream about being drunk, that tells you what you really want um, for your future. Um, that reaction is evidence that, that your mind is taking the changes that you're making seriously and that you cherish your sobriety. You're allowed to cherish it, you know. It's not all hard going. You're allowed to go, way. Um, it also might um, highlight to you what lays in store if you don't change your drinking. So the fact that you, you're you frightened that if you don't, these things might happen. Um, so it may help you put more effort in. So that's a good thing too. Or it could show where there's something wrong, if there's something else going on in your life that might trigger it. So like I said, if you're feeling stressed and it used to be a big trigger for you, or if you're feeling very emotional, it might just be your mind saying, hey, hey, deal with this. You don't have drink anymore and this is what you used to have, but you might need to deal with it in a different way. So I hope um, that explains a little bit more about why and how you have drinking dreams. It's perfectly normal. Do share them. They all tend to be the same, though. You get pissed. It's actually quite boring, whereas the other ones are vivid and exciting. So what else came up on the community this week? Let me just um, have a little look at my screen here. Um, we talked about social situations and somebody said something really interesting, which is, have I turned into a cardboard cutout of myself? And that made me um, sort of take a real big intake of breath because I just want to say, no, no, you're becoming the real you. Um, but that's not actually reassuring, is it? Because we're frightened that the, the real us is actually quite boring without that little bit of um, alcohol, that little bit of stimulation that we felt um, helped to ease social situations. So um, what, what do I need to tell you about social situations? Well, first of all, um, when you're first giving up drinking, you need to plan for those situations because you don't want them to scupper you or trip you up. Um, you don't. You want to have a nice response to people who say to you, oh, why aren't you drinking? And are you sure I can't get you a drink? Or go on, join in. And actually, it doesn't hurt to practice what you're going to say to those people. Um, find ways to shut it down quite quickly. I, I used to go, oh, well, you know, I was so good at it. Now it's time for everyone else to have a chance. Other people... Fine if you want to do white lies and say you're on antibiotics because shutting down the conversation is also quite good because it's amazing how many people want to talk to you about not drinking because they're worried about their own drinking. Oh, so how did you give up? I'm not sure if I'm ready yet. And they want to carry on talking. And actually, that's not very good for you, having to talk, particularly at the early stages, about why you've given up and how difficult it is. It's very hard to give advice to other people when you still feel you're struggling yourself. So do practice in the mirror what you want to say. Um, and you can also politely say, actually, I don't want to talk about this anymore. And that leads me on to my next point, actually, which is ultimately when you're networking, even when you're networking sober with work and a party is just networking the same, um, be curious about other people. It's a real... Um, uh, it's a habit I got out of. I used to think I was a real people person. I used to excel. Oh, I can see, talk to anybody and stick me on a council estate with anybody and I'll, I'll help them with their problems. It was something that I valued hugely. And then I realised that I was always too tired with hangover to engage with people properly. And all those small little... Um, interactions that used to happen every day on the tube or at the till at the supermarket all those small little tiny exchanges had stopped happening because I was always in too bad a mood to have them so when I began to give up drinking I began those sort of came back in because I had the energy to engage with people that made me very excited it energizes me hugely um, and then I realized that actually social situations are just you know a multitude of mini interactions all in one space and that curiosity you have about other people should be what drives you forward so instead of thinking about what you're going to say in order to tell people why you're not drinking why don't you flip it on its head and start just telling me am i still live yeah. that's good it just did a little um Thing we do be buffering um, so instead flip on on its head when you go to a party don't worry about what you're going to tell to people about why you're not drinking instead be curious about them think about five questions you want to ask people that may be there that evening um, that may be based on the interests that bring you all into a space or something you know about them how are their children um, how is their work going they're simple questions but they move you away from a discussion about you and the thing that you're not doing and that you're conscious of onto something that starts a conversation with that person. 
So finding out in advance who's going, having a bit of an idea, even have five questions in your back pocket that you could ask anybody. Do you remember when you went to, you know, university or you start a new job, there's always a whole set of questions that are a standard set of opening questions that get the ball rolling. It's no different when you give up drinking, but it's you doing it um, in a social situation. So getting over the apprehension of socialising without a drink is a real gift and it's a skill. So it doesn't come naturally. You will have to practice. It doesn't mean you're going to suddenly become the most erudite person in the world. Um, but it, you will develop. And over time, you won't notice that you have, um, have suddenly relaxed in social situations without a drink. It will actually suddenly happen. But what you've done is you've built a skill that's great for every occasion, whether it's for work, whether it's meeting new people if you move house, whether it's being in a new social situation. They don't all include drinks. So this is a skill that will take you, you know, beyond those social drinking situations. But things will be different. I do believe you can socialise without drinking, but um, people get boring after they've had about two drinks. And then you begin to recognise that they're repeating themselves. And then you get to a point where you think, well, actually, you know what I'd really like to do now is go home and do something nice, watch something a bit on the telly before I go to bed. And that's all OK. You're just changing the way your social life works. I used to think a good night out was one where I went out after work and I didn't get home till after midnight. Um, a few times of that in a week and then you're really, really tired as well as hungover. Now, good socialising for me is an hour and a half with people I really want to spend time with. I go home, get my lunch ready tomorrow, watch a bit of telly. I've still done the same amount of valuable socialising because, of course, after my second or third drink, I was not remembering any of the conversations I had. So I really want to so really begin to flip it on your head. We have a standard idea on what a good night out and socialising is in the UK, all based around alcohol. There are no rules, people. You can make up your own. Decide what's right for you. Treat yourself with, you know, love and respect and consent and say, if I don't want to be here, I don't have to stay here. If I want to stay a bit longer, I can. And if I want to go and do something else in the later part of the evening, I can as well. Like you can go out for a coffee after work and a few drinks and then you can go to the cinema and have done far more in the evening than you did before. So remember, this is about you. It's not about social expectations. It's about what you want for your time and you're going to have to start to reframe that when there's no alcohol involved but you'll gain a lot more you'll gain time you'll gain deeper more intimate relationships you will um, connect with people that had stopped connecting with you because going out with you was always about getting pissed um, and so um, it's a really positive thing and in the first few months make sure you've got something at home to reward yourself for having gone for a night out and not getting completely pissed um, and, um, and also, uh, yeah, just, um, <sighs> remember, keep focusing on what you want to do the following morning and how good waking up without the sore, sore head is. Um, I will put some links, to some articles that are relevant to this, um, when I've finished, but I've realized I can't do that at the same time as doing this, but I'll put some links up shortly. So related to that is about making new friends. I'm just checking there isn't um, any particular questions. They're coming up thick and fast and I can't actually read them all. Uh, making new friends. So I've already talked about changing the way that you socialise, but you, um, it doesn't matter where you are in the country. I'm not having this, I live, um, I'm in Leeds and there's nothing to do. Not that I'm picking on you at all, Caroline. It wasn't just about you, but it's where I was looking last at things that are not uh, things that you could do in the evening. You do have to spend a bit of time and spend a bit of time looking at what's around and go back to when you were, you know, in your 20s and they're all excited about being grown up and think what are the things that I thought I'd be doing with my life as I grew up, you know, as I saw myself in the future as this future adult. There'd be loads of things you thought you might be doing, be it adult education courses or going to the theatre or doing Tai Chi or martial arts or going to the gym. You don't have to do that bit. Or going out for evening walks. There were loads of things that we had for ourselves as we were aspiring to be adults. And then, of course, life gets in the way. And when you're drinking, um, life is harder because you're trying to always keep going with a hangover. Um, but then you also get into a real default mode on what a good night out is. And it becomes that night in the pub. 
you're going to have to tear all of that up and go back to the person you thought you were going to be when you were 20 and go, well, what did I think I was going to be doing? Was I going to be doing life drawing? Was I going to be doing photography? Now is the time to make that list and say, right, where would I find them where I live? Some of them may be a short drive. If you've got a car, that's not a problem anymore because you're not drinking. Um, where where might you connect? Might it be a local WI? Might it be the local adult education college? Do you want to get a subscription to the cinema? Do you want to join a walking group? Go to meet up and you'll start to find that there are people with all sorts of weird and wacky interests. And you know what? If you don't enjoy it, you don't find any friends, you don't have to carry on going. You can find something else. It doesn't matter if this week you're a walker and next week you're a runner and the week after you're doing Tai Chi. Try them out. You've got time to do it. You've got energy to do it. Nobody's forcing you to do anything. This isn't a lifetime commitment to now suddenly become a novelist just because you've gone to a creative writing course. But they are things that will allow you to test and explore new boundaries, new social situations and making new friends. Um, and Meetup is a really good place to do that wherever you are in the country. I appreciate that things aren't always so good if you're in a rural area but um i i still think there are things that you can find and people to connect with and the internet makes that far easier than before and you know making friends is as easy as saying asking somebody you know what they're doing and who they are and building that over up over a number of weeks what's the worst that can happen you don't click whoopie doo da then you'll find some other people and in amongst all of that there'll be people that you will click with um and i really do think that finding new friends and new connections with people and finding new interests is one of the greatest gifts out of giving yourself time and space um, that isn't thinking constantly about drinking. Um, so make that list of things that you thought you always were going to do or wanted to be when you were um, younger and see if you can start doing some of them. The next theme that came up this week Oh, see, look, I talk like loads, don't I? I've managed to squeeze loads into 17 minutes. Um, I can't really see if people have got lots of questions, but I'm asking you, see, to let me know um, because there's lots of stuff going on in the stream underneath. Hangover depression, or you can call it an anxiety or guilt or anxiety or shame spiralling. And I think it's particularly um, bad for people who know that they want to give up drinking because every time you have a hangover it feels like a failure so it doesn't just feel like I feel guilty because I'm, I'm worried that I was rude to somebody last night actually what you're feeling is something far far more personal you're feeling like you failed because you haven't created a hundred percent perfection and I think that's quite a negative um, place for you to be in so of course the best way to avoid um, hangover guilt is not to have a hangover but we know that's not easy because we wouldn't all be here I also want to say that changing your drinking isn't a linear process you can't just decide today that you're going to give up and it will work first time you have to accept that this is a journey you're on and you have to keep trying new things and working on it until it sticks and so you would have seen that loads of people in the community said oh it's day one again today it's day one again today um, Janet has now got today Oh, you're on four weeks, aren't you, Janet? And like you had tons of day ones before. Um, but what I think that's really interesting for Janet is that she's each time she's picked herself up again and said, this isn't a failure. This is another lesson that I'm learning. This is what I've learned from having this hangover. What am I going to do next time that's different? You are not going to achieve 100% perfection because that's impossible for anybody. We create such a big weight on ourselves that we're going to give up drinking, lose weight, go running, do the marathon, always wash up, um, always have our lunch pack for the next day. And if we don't do any one of those things, then we hit the fuck it button and, and reach for drink. So that means because we haven't made lunch for tomorrow that we're hitting the fuck it button. That's ridiculous. It's a, it's a ridiculous way that we've got into thinking about our drinking. So if you do drink and you feel guilty the next morning, I think there are several things you need to do. You need to think about the night before and the point where you started to drink more than you intended. If you're moderating, what, what level, what bar did you set yourself for stopping? What stopped you from stopping? If you're quitting, what encouraged you to have the first drink? How can you avoid that situation in future? What can you do um, to... to, um, to uh, 
negate that circumstance? You know, what do you need to put in place? Oh, thanks, Janet, you're on day 30. Hooray! But what do you put in place in order to make sure that you... Um, uh, that, that that won't happen again what do you need to do that's different and write that down as well what was the problem what do you need to do that's different so you can avoid this situation the second thing is is alcohol um, messes with your mind so the morning after you've drunk not only are you low because you haven't received uh, achieved 100 percent perfection but also that you um but uh, alcohol is making you feel much much worse about it and therefore your doom and gloom are more likely to reach for the bottle again so recognize that you've taken a mind altering substance and it's altering your mind and instead focus on self care so instead of self flagellation and going it's terrible i've not drunk I, I drank so tomorrow i will actually run two marathons and i will only eat one lettuce leaf and that will be my punishment for having done so bad Instead, go, hang on a minute, take a step back. I need to treat myself with a bit of love and a bit of respect. And I need to um, look after myself because I am doing something hard. I am trying to change my drinking. You know, one in five people in Britain want to change their drinking. You know, if it was easy, they'd all be bloody well doing it. You're actually one of the brave people. So accept the fact that you're doing something hard and treat yourself well. What is it that you can do for yourself that will make you feel good? Do you need to paint your toenails? Do you need to go for a walk? Do you need to clean out the fridge? Is that just me? Oh, okay. Anyway, but find something that you feel is about nurturing and self-care that moves you on rather than means that you're always looking in the past. Um... And, and learn new ways to treat yourself because this is really important because when you want to drink or when you're craving think you're craving for a drink what you're doing is you're dealing with discomfort and you need to um, put something in place of that discomfort so that you don't give in to that craving and so you actually need to learn new ways to look after yourself and do nice things for yourself so um Self-care is an investment worth making. It's learning new things that make you happy, that trigger all the happy places in your head, that make you feel relaxed and calm and guilt-free. So it's not easy. It's a skill that you're learning, but it's a skill that next time um, the gap between you having a hangover this time and the time after will be less or more or whatever. But you know, you're, you're progressing towards a goal. Um, but don't, whatever you do, do not let the fact that you've drunk last night mean that you hit the fuck it button and give up altogether. Otherwise, you undo all of the work. So, yes, sometimes change your drinking is like one step forward and two steps back. Um, but at least you're still taking steps forward. If you hit the fuck it button, you're not. You've gone out the escape pod. You're in another universe. You've given up on everything that you've learned. And actually... I don't want you to do that. I want you to carry on learning and progressing because you will get there in the end, just like Janet has, just like Susie has, who's now on eight months um, without a drink. She also had lots of day ones at the beginning. You would have seen that there. So we talked about day ones. Um, do you count the days? Well, um, it's entirely up to you. And... Um, I've seen people in this group who count the days that they drink and don't drink by putting a photo on a calendar app so that they can see all the great things they've done instead on the days they didn't drink. And over time, that's helped them have more picture days than non-picture days. If that's what helps you, go for it. If having a counter app like I think Caroline does and Janet does and others um, means that you can see that continuously, that's brilliant. I also noticed that Janet, um, I'm sorry I'm talking about you a lot today, Janet, but you, you, you've come up with some good news over the last few days. And I also like the way that you calculated the fact that you had done more sober days than drunk days this year. And that's something to celebrate. Um, and I really do think it is something to celebrate because it shows each time you're edging closer to the goal you want. Um, and you could also look at streaks. So, you know, is it 10 days since you last drunk? And then can you make that next time 12 days before you drink again? Um, and could you then make that 14 days and so on? So you could actually do it in streaks, although preferably don't, um, you know, do a streak so that you're there waiting on the day 12 with a drink. But you are allowed to be proud guys you know it doesn't matter if you've just managed one day two days three days or you're counting number of full moons that you've had um sober 
tell us about it. You're allowed to be proud. Just because it's not 100% perfection doesn't mean that it's not worth celebrating. I really think it, it is. Okay, have we got any uh, questions? Uh, uh, oh, look, I can go back. No, but Sophie's on her um, Kravis ginger beer rather than the lemon and ginger tea, chilled tea. Okay, so next on my list is about summer holidays because um, I've actually been quite jealous of everybody's holiday pictures. <laughs> and um, there are a few more of you going on holiday, so I thought it'd be worth just recapping on some bits and pieces. Um, first of all, um, uh, we, I talked about reframing what a social night out is um, at the start of this webinar. I think you should do that for your holiday as well. Um, uh, I went to a conference recently where they told us that um, Brits um, undercount their calories anyway, um, under, undercount the units, sorry, they drink anyway, but they don't even count the units they drink on holiday. And so the um, statisticians have made up a figure for the average number of units that people drink on holiday, and it's probably about a month's worth all in one week. And in some ways, if you think about it, that's utterly bizarre. You're going to rest and recuperate for a week. And instead, what you're doing is putting a poison in your body every day that will slow you down, make you lethargic and mean that you might spend half the day in bed. So it might be worth spending a little bit of time in the week lead up to your holiday thinking, this is my week. This is my week to sleep and relax and look after myself and to see some new things and be excited about the people that I'm with. So why would I want to ruin that by drinking all the way through and feeling so tired when I come back that I don't feel rested at all? So start to really look at the logic of how you see your holiday. Um, we're seeing it as an excuse to start drinking during the day rather than as a way to see a new place. Oh, we're a bit weird as Brits, aren't we? So, um, so start to, to think about reframing that. And imagine what a holiday would feel like if after seven days you came back rested and recuperated, having had seven nights brilliant sleep without a hangover at all. That you were able to get up when the sun rose and have a swim in that pool that you've always looked at but never gone into. Oh, I'm just having a look at what's coming up. So try and do that. Then plan some things that are about restoring you. You know, is it about a swim? Is it about reading a book? Is it about going for walks? Is it about seeing some new things? And start to plan your holiday a little bit more based on what is it I want to get out of this, this trip? What is it that will make me feel like I've treated myself? Um, if I'm not spending some money on alcohol, maybe I could spend it on a day trip out somewhere. Maybe I can spend it on um, a really lovely meal in one of the best restaurants in the area. Maybe I can spend it on this, that or the other. Um, but begin to build those treats in. Just because you're on holiday and it's de facto a treat, it doesn't mean that you don't need those treats. Um, and on holiday, actually, no one else notices when you're not drinking because they they really are not looking, even less than in a social situation, because we're all awkward in a social situation. But on holiday, we really don't care. And in most places, the um, the uh, they do a lot better soft drinks. So when we were in Ibiza last year, I mean, it was okay that at midnight I was sat on the, the seafront um, having a, a fruit juice because you're in a hot country, so why wouldn't you? Um, no one else actually notices that you're not drinking. And the other thing is, is if you're on an all-inclusive holiday, just because it's included, there are good things included as well. There are healthy foods included. There are gym and activities included. So why do we always look at the things that are bad for us as being the things that we need to indulge on an all-inclusive holiday, rather than the fact that there are loads of good things that, that, that you normally wouldn't be able to afford to do? If you can't normally afford to go to a gym or have a swimming pool that's just down the stairs from you, um, if you don't have those things normally at home, then they are the treat, are they not? Are they not the great thing to have? So reframe your holiday as actually being a holiday and not a drink fest. Otherwise we will know because you wouldn't have taken a picture of an alcohol-free beer and your pink toenails and shared it on Club Soda, which there's been quite a few of. Actually, there's been some lovely photos. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, so I'm just going to check um, for any more questions. La, 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 la. 
Oh, you're all just showing off to each other. I must, shall I just carry on talking? I'll just carry on talking. Um, summer holidays. Oh, no, I've just done that. Um, triggers. Triggers. So um, I thought um, Helen came on earlier, Helen Wheeler, um, who said that she's already spotting her, um, her triggers and beginning to look at how you might avoid them and changing your routine. That is awesome, awesome news. Um, uh, and... Um, I'll just come back to that. Nadia, yes, I, it will be what you can watch this afterwards and it'll also be on the YouTube channel. Um, your triggers can be wide and varied. One of my triggers is still one of my best friends whenever he's visiting. It's the one time I feel like drinking a bit more, be, uh, well, drinking at all, because um, we used to do lots of drinking together. And sometimes when it's sunny, um, that's a trigger as well. Um, if I've been for a long walk and we stop, stop at a pub, um, but sometimes the, the triggers can be far more subtle. It, it'd be just about a whole set of circumstances in a day. But you can begin to write those down. You can write some of them in advance, but also keep a list as you're going along because you can begin to look at how you might avoid that trigger because your response to a trigger um, could be different depending on what that trigger is. So, for example, if you get home from work and you're normally used to opening a bottle of wine, it's probably because you're thirsty and it's probably because you want to create a break between that was work and this is now my time. So what can you do instead that does that? Well, you could find an alternative drink and make sure it's always in the fridge. So the minute that trigger strikes, you can go, yep, yeah, I've got the answer to that. Boom. That's a two second response. That, and you've, you've cut that time between a hankering for drink and doing something about it. Um, it may be that some of those triggers are a lot rarer, like you know a stressful day at work or somebody being a complete idiot and you just don't know what to do about it again you can begin to put in place some things that you might do a fast walk around the block um, you might have a book that you're treating yourself to just one chapter to every day and that you might use that as a way to break that mental um anxiety over the bad thing that's happened today and what happens to the rest of your evening like i said i've had to take up um, watching TV again this year because I realised I wasn't taking that mental break from a hard day and t a TV programme takes me into another story and it means that when I come back out the other side I feel refreshed and invigorated. Um, so um, I will share with you a couple of blogs that people have written about triggers um, and things um, and they've begun to write quite a long list because um, sometimes it's about doing things that you've never done before or things that you've wanted to do or things that have made you happy in one other situation that actually if you did it more often might make you happier um, uh, when you're not drinking. So it could be, you know, doing some writing. It could be, um, oh, let me think of some things. Oh, there's a whole list. I'm just going to post a list. That's what I will do. That's what I said. Uh, uh, free... Free versus cheap treat self-care. If I have any more baths, I'll prune up. Um, yes, Sophie, I, um, you're absolutely right. Um, I, try, I try not to use the hot bath. Um, <laughs> um, treat is the only possible treat that you can have because I also think it's very specific. You know, we're not all the same. Um, we've actually got a really long list that I will get you see to dig out of um, rewards that people have found for themselves. But actually spending an hour on websites like Frugal and Groupon and Time Out and um, some of the other things is actually a nice way to spend some time because you're thinking about finding the cheapest deal and and booking that treat that you can look forward to um i do that with like theater tickets i need to get the cheap ones so it takes me a good half hour to go through the dates and by that point the thought of chocolate cake or even a drink has gone out of my mind um so uh so you need to begin to find the things that are right for you um and and they may be weather dependent i don't so i i mean i I will share the long list that we've got with you because the ones that come to mind are quite personal um, to me. And uh, I, I often, uh, the other thing I do is go, who I haven't seen this week? Um, and I start going through my list of friends and start working out some social stuff that I can look forward to in the foreseeable future. And that can take quite a while as well because people never get back to you. And sometimes it's really hard to organise a date. In the olden days, we used to phone each other and now we organise a time to phone someone that's also really weird. 
Um, yeah, other people's Pinterests, other people's blogs, other people's ideas are are great. Dream holiday browsing, yeah, Sophie. Um, Nadia, do you have specific on speed dial or did you, in your early days for support? Um, I totally think you should try and build your cheerleading team and make it as wide or as narrow as you want. But it actually brings me on to another subject because somebody also brought up about um, how to deal with your partner if you're not drinking. And I think whether you're in a relationship or not, whether you live with your partner or not, whether your setup's different, that um, that we all, we all have friends and we all need people to help us. And actually it really helped me hugely that I... I gave up drinking with my partner at the beginning of the relationship because the relationship was new and exciting. So that kept me going low. It's like, oh, I'm finding out new things about this person every day and we can go to bed together and it's really nice and sweet. Um, so that was really good for me. And so that, that friend became my mutual support, but that's also not available to everybody. Um, so start to do a list of friends that you think are the most supportive friends. I don't think you should be embarrassed about asking people for help, but you should also be specific about what you think would be useful. So don't just go, oh, I need you to help me, because actually as a friend, even if it was the, the shoe was on the other foot and somebody was asking you for help with something, unless they were specific to you about what they needed, that's so vague that it's not possible. Um, so even if it's your partner and you're saying, right, I, I've decided I'm going to give up drinking or I'm going to reduce my drinking. So, dear best friend, dear partner, I would like you to help me. Now, that's actually a really um, positive um, way to start the discussion because you're asking them for help. Who refuses help to somebody that they like and respect? Nobody refuses to help. But then rather than just leave it in the air, start saying specific things um, that would help. And also let them know that it may change. Next week I may have learned something new about my change in relationship with alcohol and I may ask you to do something different. But this week it would be really helpful if we could find some social activities that don't involve drinking. Or when we have um, a drink with a meal, it'd be really nice if we could spend some time today together looking for alternative drinks that I can have. Or could you just not pressure me when we're in the pub to have a drink and just support me? Or if you see me wavering in the pub when other people are trying to um, um, tell me to have a drink, tell me how proud you'll be if I get through this week without a drink. People will like specific instructions and you don't have to just rely on one person for that. I still think that one of the defining factors for me on being able to change my drinking was the fact that I told four of my closest friends um, the day that I, I had sat, I said, I'm going to do something about this. I've booked a, a one day workshop. Um, this is the day I've set. And the look of relief on their faces told me more than anything that you could imagine. Um, and... Um, that, that really helps. So if you can then give those friends and loved ones specific tasks and roles, um, then that's important too. None of this is going to be easy, um, but you can make it easier for yourself by being specific with the people that you think can help you the most. Um, so that's cool. Okay. So, and if they, and if you want those people, Nadia, to be on speed dial, ask them. You might want to share that load between some people or you might want to let people know specifically that when you contact them, what it is that you're hoping that they, they can do for you. Because again, it's quite scary when someone says, I'm, I'm having a really low and terrible time and I don't know what to do. They need to be able to know what sort of support it is you need in that sort of circumstance. You may want to meet for coffee together to talk about it first of all, which is then a social and really important part of the process as well. Okay, then the final bit I'm going to touch on is um, a question that, uh, Joe asked, which is, um, which is clearly a preoccupation in, in preoccupation in Joe's mind at the minute, which is when did I decide forever? Um, and that's an interesting one because I don't think I ever did. Um, I I knew I had to do something. I do lots of things by instinct and very quickly. Like I decided the other night um, that I had. Um, that I would do a playwriting course. I booked it by the next morning. I mean, some people would take some more time to think about it. Um, but I'm very impulsive. And so 
I, I decided I had to do something about it and for me therefore I have to take action immediately it's really difficult for me not to then take action and so I found um, a one day workshop and I booked it it's partly why we run our workshops as well because I also knew that as an extrovert being in a space with other people would really help I I did not know whether I would be able to do it or not I hadn't done lots of the planning that I suggest that you do I wish I had done um, but equally, I had a set of circumstances that I think made it a bit easier, which is, you know, having somebody else doing it with me. Um, I never for one minute believed I could do this. So the fact that I did still surprises me. And um, like I said, I think there are a number of factors that made that possible. And one is the person that I gave up with also fell off the wagon several times and it was hideous. And we talked earlier about... Um, hangover shame and and feeling upset when you you you've fallen off the wagon oh my god um she scared the shit out of me she did she didn't only just fall off the wagon she she drank everything that was on the wagon and and everything off it and 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 the the guilt and remorse uh was terrible the next day and so part of me felt that it was part of my responsibility to keep her on the straight and narrow which is a very strong calling for me which is to help other people um, and also I didn't want to do that myself. I saw how hideous that was and I was frightened that if I had one drink I would have loads. So I didn't ever believe I could do it, but I did. And that perfect storm of factors together really helped. I then began to really enjoy being sober. Um, the fact that um, I could engage in discussion and argument again with people and be a pain in the arse and write complaint letters and do all sorts of things that I think incredibly valuable <laughs> um, was really important to me and so that being able to engage with my head again and being able to make a decision and act on it was really important um, I did used to think that I was in a job that I didn't enjoy and I did think that I couldn't leave that job until I sobered up but actually that's never that isn't how that happened I had to get out that job before I could sober up um, and see what I valued um, hugely. Um, I now take great pleasure out of if somebody's got a really nice cocktail, I go, oh, can I try that? And I try a sip and I look. they look at me in horror as if somehow I'm going to suddenly fall off the wagon because I've had a sip. But I, I, I get a perverse joy out of having a sherry trifle and realising that that isn't going to make me fall off the wagon. Um, that, that I'm strong enough to know that what I've got now, I value yeah, hugely. And but I had a perfect storm of factors. I still take great joy out of being able to take a sip or have a bit of dessert. And I still tell people I'm taking it up again when I'm 70. But who knows? I, I, I fear too much if I actually drank a whole pint. And I, I have too much that I value, including my relationship with UC and doing all of this stuff that I really don't want to jeopardise it by drinking again earlier. But my phone is red hot is a top tip don't put your phone in a yogurt pot when you're doing a webinar all right guys um thank you very much bye